You're listening to the Tumbling Saber Podcast, a member of the Star Wars Commonwealth Podcast Network. Check us out on the web at StarWarsCommonwealth.com, on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter, and take your first step into a larger world. Everybody, welcome back to episode 80 of the Tumbling Saber podcast. My name's Kyle. My name's Corey. And I'm as stoked as a bonfire at a surf beach. <laughs> uh, and a very happy Father's Day out there to everybody. I know this is a bit late, but uh, we hope all the dads out there, dads to be, and sons of dads, uh, had a great Father's Day weekend. Uh, how you guys doing? You guys have a good Father's Day? Yeah, I'm beat. I have to say, my wife uh, really shone brightly this year. I had a pretty epic Father's Day. Nice. Very yeah, man, cool. it was excellent. You, Kyle? It was very quiet. I did not leave the house all day. <laughs> That's nice. That's nothing it wrong with that. It was not bad, yeah. I yeah. got to uh, you know, hang around, hang around by the pool, vacuum the pool, get ready for the show, do a lot of things that uh, normally I've got a couple of kids hanging off me as I do it, and today I got to do it in relative silence. Nice. That's a pretty good gift. Uh, if if I would have had things go my way, I think I, I would have rather liked to spend the... I, I would have liked to, for it to have been a rainy day and just spent it in bed. All day in bed. But no. Actually, I had a pretty good weekend though. I saw you I saw you yesterday, Kyle, and that was pretty fun. We both scored pretty hard, James, yesterday on our, uh, on our Star Wars purchases. The second wave finally dropped in various stores out here. I didn't find any... I, I, I got two articles there but they weren't that great but my one big score is that i found bay's malbus which is like pretty rare and hard figure to find so i was so stoked about that like i literally gasped when i found it i was like oh my god and kyle kyle too he, he hooked up some some 40th stuff second wave so it's it's dropping now which is pretty sweet so that was a nice little cherry on top on the father's day weekend nice man good for you yeah, yeah I, I said, you know, I, I, you guys know I said I was, I'm not going to get into the 40th anniversary stuff. It's not going to happen. It happened. <laughs> and, and by the way, nobody believed a word of I'm not going to get into collecting. Anytime you say you're not going to get into it is basically you saying out loud to yourself something that you know is going to happen eventually. Well, I, I, I know that the collector bug is buzzing around me, but it hasn't sunk its stinger in fully yet. Like I've, I've uh, bought uh, full denial. Cool, cool. <laughs> because well eventually the, the figures that i want will disappear and i i know i won't go on ebay to get them that's not going to happen but i did pick up han uh han solo which i, I passed up the earlier last week because the, the card was was bent uh so rather than picking up a, a bent card han solo i waited my wife actually found one for me and she picked it up and then i was in the store i was in toys r us uh, a couple days ago and i found chewy as part of the second wave, as Corey mentioned. And I said, well, you can't have Han without Chewie. So I bought him. And I've got the Wookiee, I've got Han, I've got the 40th anniversary uh, Luke X-Wing pilot figure from uh, Celebration. And I don't know, that's, that might be about it for me. I, I, I know I'm going to pick up the Leia. And if I ever see Vader at a, a discounted price, I'll pick that up. But that's going to be it. I know I'm not going to pick up a Jawa. I just don't care. Uh, the Death Star Trooper guy, don't care. Stormtrooper, same thing. Um, yeah, man, C-3PO, R2, those, whatever. I, I'll live without those figures. But uh, yeah, Corey, that's I'm it, gonna man. I'm gonna call him a liar. If I was editing the show, I'd use that uh, that sound clip from uh, the Princess Bride <laughs> where where the witch the witch starts screaming out liar. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. So you, uh, I you said think, I, you, th you guys, you guys think that I'm gonna go go for it and just get nuts and get all twelve or however many I, there are fortieth anniversaries. I, I do know that that could that is an outside possibility. If you if you did buy one or two more, you might end up with the whole set. But like to say that like I'll just live without them tells me that you want the droids and eventually they will be they will be yours. Well, I, I could say straight up, I, I lied. I said I wasn't gonna collect the whole <laughs> set. And yeah, like I like I remember I was totally dumping on the. Uh, Death Squad Commander or whatever, and I, I picked them up on the weekend. I was like, yeah, why not? 
Like I'm only really I'm missing R2 from the first wave and Kyle's X Wing pilot, but that's an exclusive. And you know, I have the R five. Now I got the Jawa and that Death Squad commander, so you know I'm gonna go all the way with this man if I can. I just need a few more. I got I need give me like four more maybe. No, that's awesome, guys. Yeah, no, I, I'm saying with ninety percent certainty that I will not <laughs> buy. No, ninety five. I'm go, I'm going deeper, man. I'm gonna commit. I am not gonna buy any more than Leia and Vader if I find Vader at a discounted price. If not, too bad. I'm not gonna have them. If people want to buy them for me, that's a different story. I'll I'll, I'll gladly accept. So you but are you related to Lupul's your brother. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Hey guys, uh, quickly now, the best dads in Star Wars. James, what do you got? Hmm. My my instinct, my, like my initial gut reaction, is to go with like the Yoda as like the grandfatherly figure. Like I like if I was gonna go to like for sage advice in life, I'd want to go to Yoda. But I don't know if that's my best answer. I don't know if I had an hour or a day to think about it if I would keep that answer. But for now, I'll say I don't think there's a more, um, you know sage wise sort of uh trust in my experience kind of guy than yoda well that that is a thoughtful answer nonetheless who knows maybe maybe yoda does have a bunch of little kids running around the galaxy maybe in his earlier years he was quite the uh there is the swordsman in a different way and maybe yaddle is his daughter and she's half his age so there you go yaddle 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 is yoda's daughter we're going to run with that. <laughs> you heard it here first. Corey, what do you got? Who's the best dad in Star Wars? If you want, want me to give you, like, I think there's one definitive answer. You want that first or you want a few shout outs first? L- build your way up to it. All right, let's go. We, uh, Jabba might not be that too bad. In the Clone Wars movie, in the animated movie that was the de- premiere of this series, like, he seemed to care quite deeply about his son. But, yeah, Slamo, no, it's just, just a shout out. Django. Django and Boba had quite the relationship, you know. He was a single father. <laughs> well, very much Jan- to- Django wanted to be a dad so badly, he he was willing, he did forego the best part of having kids, which is making the kids in order to have one. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so and, Django uh, definitely makes the list. And he cared a lot. You could tell he... Yeah, he, he seemed uh, to really care about Boba. But at the same time, I mean, throwing the kid in the mix like that and having him, you know, still very shady and not very ethical and not very safe for... Well, he he loses points for having him at the the Geonosis Arena for the for the execution. That's not a thing you should make your kid witness. That's so you lose points for that. And he's right off the list for naming him Boba. <laughs> Boba. Yeah. Um, Come here, Boba. Not not a cool name. I gotta give you that. All right, Corey, keep going. All right. So next up, uh, we got Uncle Owen. Even though he's not a father, you know he was. He obviously loved and cared for Luke. Uh, Probably almost a little too much. And, you know, he was, you could tell he, Luke didn't have it all that easy, you know, like uh, Uncle Owen showed him the the good old, the good old style, you know, the good old ways. Yeah. Here's the thing I want to, I want to interject just for a second. I feel like, I feel like Corey is building his way to to somewhere. Um, And all I want to say is if he's going where I think he is, you know, doing something really cool at the end doesn't make you a good father if you weren't there for most of it. Oh, yeah, dude. Don't <laughs> if, worry. If, if I'm just going to say, if Corey goes with Anakin as best dad, I'm hanging up on him. Well, I, I don't think he is, but you, but Han is basically the same kind of dad as Anakin. Like, he only redeems himself at the very end when he puts his, his you know, puts himself on the line. But I, I, I just want to interject it to, to, like, throw off Corey before he goes where he's going, because <laughs> I think he's going to come in there with too much luster. He already said, like, there's one definitive answer, so I'm just trying to there knock him off There is one definitive horse. answer. Like, don't worry, man. <laughs> the answer, the answer, Mr. O'Flaherty, is Bail Organa. Oh, okay, okay. That is the correct answer. I'm my okay. Faith restored in Corey. That is that is the correct answer, and it's ding, it's ding, weird. Ding, ding, we ding, have ding, the ding, same ding. list. Oh, it's, cool. it's hard to argue with Bail. You can't really argue that Bail is probably the best dad out there. He helped raise a senator, a princess, and a general, and he seemed like a stand-up guy through and through from beginning to end. So, yeah, man. Uh, Bail Organa is top of the list. Yeah, you can see, like, even at, uh, you know, at a very young age, Leia was a part of the rebellion. 
But, you know, he probably raised her in such a way that he couldn't stop her at a point. Like, even if he's just like, my love, you can't do this, whatever. Like, I won't let you. And she'd be like, father, get the heck out of my way, you know? Like, well, I'm doing this. I, I definitely can't disagree with that. But I can't believe nobody said that Galen is, is on the list. Ooh, that's a good one. My stardust. That's a very good yeah, one because he sacrificed yeah. everything. He, he, he put a lot on the line for his, for his little girl. Yeah, he put his whole life. He put... You know, he missed watching her grow up all. Well, he was. Pre- if, if you read, I mean, you, you can take what you want out of Rogue One, but Catalyst gives a much clearer, or I guess more complete picture of his father, his, his presence as a father, and he was a very distracted father. He, he clearly loved his daughter, and he spent time with her when and where he could, and he was very affectionate and loving, but for the most part, he was mostly distracted by his work. Yeah, he's, he's kind of like uh, a way for periods at a time and working weird yeah i know what you mean well the, the intentions were there the heart was there but the mind wasn't so yes it, i think galen should have been on the list probably could have bumped Django. i think he's a better father than Django. or um, jabba <laughs> jabba let's, let's be for real jabba has no place on this list i, I bet you well nah no J- jabba no it's, it's a it's a straight no but yeah, no, good, good call, James. I'm glad you, you kind of got Galen in there at the last minute. He deserves to be on the list. Okay, and guys, we have a new member of the Commonwealth to welcome to the family. Uh, say hello to the San Diego Sabres Radio Podcast. Excellent. Hello, hello. What's going on? No, so I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to I'm not going to bore you San with Diego? details. Yeah, San Diego. What does Will <laughs> Ferrell say about San Diego? We all know Diego? what that means. Yeah, I know this. I for, I forget what it is. It's something anybody... to do with it's something to do with a whale. Yes. Oh, but I think he's talking about the. Uh... You're taking the winds right out of the sails here, buddy. Yeah, sorry, I'm not right googling up. it. So. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the San Diego Sabers Radio Podcast. A very unique show, as they they focus a lot on uh, is light lightsaber combat technique, fencing, and. Uh, dueling skills that's pretty cool we don't we don't have a show like that at all and we're, what we're trying to do at the star wars commonwealth is, is build out a network of shows that really uh tick all the boxes for any type of star wars fan out there and this is a very very unique show and um well you know what we we, we got a little audio clip here from from steve from the san diego sabers uh so we'll let we'll let steve explain to us explain to us uh more fully about who they are and what they do Hi, this is Steve from the San Diego Sabres radio podcast. Together with my hosts, Eric and Robert, we run San Diego Sabres, a lightsaber combat training group. Each week, we talk about lightsaber combat, Star Wars news, interview special guests, or we just find something silly and fun to talk about. You can find us online at our website, sandiegosabers.net. On Facebook and Instagram, we're SD Sabres, and on Twitter, we're SD Sabres Podcast. Or you can email us using podcast at sandiegosabers.net. And there we go. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sending in that audio clip. And uh, welcome to the family, guys. Uh, glad to have you aboard. And looking forward to hearing your show. It's I've, I've listened to a few episodes as as you know we did this onboarding process. And uh, good job, Rob Williams over at Gen X Wing, our global director of talent procurement. Good job, man. Is that his Don't new we... official title? Because I haven't seen I haven't seen his new uh, <laughs> his new sign on on the door. Is that is that what they were penciling in there with the with the sticky tape? That well, that that's the promotion that we gave, and uh, that, that I hope that's what sticks. I like he's it. Off, he, he's awfully good at it. It's uh, it's le- nice. It's a lot shorter than his old title, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's lucky number seven, man. <laughs> oh man! All right, so not much else going on this weekend. Uh, we did our little collecting update, um, but the Freemakers were back this weekend. Uh, two new episodes dropped this weekend. I watched those both on Father's Day. As I was preparing for the show, uh, no surprises there. We 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 know what to expect from the Freemakers. It's just a light-hearted, funny adventure. Uh, but it was really nice. We got to see Hera, Chopper, and Quarry all Ooh. reprising the roles from Rebels. Really nice stuff. So I'm glad it's back. But it was it's a really really strange schedule going on there. I, I know that the first two episodes drop this weekend, and then the next one doesn't drop until. Uh, I want to say July 31st, so we have a long time between now and then, and then it's it's like new episodes every Monday through Thursday for two weeks, and then it's gone again. 
So it's kind of a strange schedule for programming. I don't quite get it, but uh, looking forward to it. I'm glad it's back. It was like, uh, it's a nice summer tonic in a, in a place where we have no real new Star Wars stuff on TV. So welcome back, Freemakers. Corey, did you have a chance to check it out? I have not, but I did uh, PVR it, so I will make the time to watch it at one point with my son and make sure he's on board with it as well because, you know, it's half the fun of it these days. Make sure he's on board. <laughs> yeah. How dare you? All right, guys, let's get into some Star Wars news here. Not a ton from last week, but uh, everything that we got going on seems to revolve around Colin Trevorrow. Ooh. Yeah, uh, he seems he seems to be a bit of a lightning rod at the moment. Uh, so we'll... <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. I don't know. I, it just makes Corey, so much sense. <clears throat> you seem particularly... Uh... He's very tickled by that lightning rod comment. Yeah, but he seems also just particularly lighthearted tonight. I think he's, he's receptive to all humor. I think we're going to be able to light Corey up tonight. Oh, man, <laughs> I'm so tired. Dude, I was in the sun all day, and then I went to go to the movies, and I had ate two smoked meat sandwiches tonight, man. Two from what? Pete's. Yeah, from yeah. Pete's. From Pete's, baby. Oh, one of them was a jumbo. What is wrong? What the hell? Aren't we doing that in, like tomorrow? I don't know. That was the plan. It's smoked meat spaghetti tomorrow on special. Two for one. <laughs> <sighs> Anyway, Who, why would you eat two smoked meat sandwiches on a day where it's 35 degrees Celsius? It was his father's day. Yeah, I don't fault you for that. I would have eaten two smoked meat sandwiches. I went to uh, Sove's and ate a poutine and a bunch of greasy food there too, so. Nice. Yeah. I mean, was, was it unnaturally hot today or what? It was. Oh. We went and flew a kite. It was a bit windy, so that was cool. But it was, it's like a it was a hot wind. It was, dude. A really I, gross hot wind. I, I actually, you know, I, I actually got up relatively early. I said I didn't really want to, but I said, okay, you know, it's it's hot, it's nice, the sun's out, everything looks good. Like, let's get on the boat like right away. So we took off at like I don't know, it was like ten thirty or, or eleven. Then you know, like probably around two, we're like we should start heading back because we had tickets to the go see Cars three. But, like, we could have stayed out longer, you know what I mean? But, uh, anyhow, I was watching the weather, and I was like, no, I want to go back now. My wife was like, oh, I guess so, whatever. And I'm telling you, we got out onto the open water, man, and it was, like, the high seas, bro. <laughs> like, it was really, really, really bad. And then, it, basically, as soon as I latched, like, the last button on the tarp when I had it docked and whatnot, it started raining. It was, like, you perfect. Lucky. Yeah. Well, not lucky. I think it was just well-timed on my part, that's all. <laughs> is, that, is that where we're at now? It'll you're, be skill when he gets when he brings seas? it in early. It'll be skill, and the days he gets caught in the rain, it'll be bad luck. Uh huh. That's where we're at now. He, he's an ace pilot on the water. After what three trips out? No, I just kind of paid attention to the weather patterns and <laughs> played my. Ah, oh, he's so in tuned with nature and the seas that he can tell the weather. He well, knows. He feels I, it in his bones. You you could tell. I Plus, tell he has that app. Brewing. Get <laughs> off the, the water. dot com. The wind, <laughs> now, everyone else stayed, whatever, but the wind was really picking up and I don't know, I just didn't like what I saw and it was better then than to wait, so I did should get Should we do a, a, like a weekly ding report? Any more dings on the boat that, no. we, that we should know about? No, everything's been going pretty good. Today was pretty crazy. holding though. out? No. I feel Today... like he's holding out too. I feel like if there was a small ding, I don't think he would tell us. No, there's no yeah. dings. I'll, I'll tell you, there, there were some close calls today though. Some some people like my anchor was like firmly set, so I wasn't moving. But I was in that bay again, and there's like it was like it's up, the water is probably just a bit over my knees, okay? So like the boat's like right there, it's like perfect, and everyone just goes there. And there's so it's just, it's pretty high traffic area at one point, and some people like they start moving around, and I don't know, it starts getting a little, it, it gets pretty crazy, especially on like a date like today. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I came pretty close to someone else. I was. I moved, I pushed the boat out a bit and then started it up. But by the time I had it started up and going, man, I was like, oof, like getting feet away from this other guy. It was, Let, it okay, moved. this is what, this is what I, this would be a dream come true for the show. If you ever ding the boat up while you're out on the water, I want you to call me on Skype so I can record your, like the panic attack on the water. And then we can put it back in the show for the audience. 
Yeah, well, let's do that. I don't even have Skype on my phone, first of all, and I'm sure that would be my first my That first can be thought. rectified in probably 20 seconds. Yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> oh, that would be a, that would be a dream. I'm, I'm the listeners. I'm Corey. Don't be so selfish for posterity, man. No, I'm uh, I'm pretty I'm pretty keen what I'm going to do this year. So I'm not going to take do anything crazy. I know my path, where I'm going to get to my dock and all that stuff. I, the open waters. I mean, there's nothing really to that. I mean, do you know what kind of wood your dock's made out of? Nope. Is it, could could it be hickory? I don't know. <laughs> what kind of setup is this? <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. All right, just check. It's a nice, it's a nice dock though. This guy, the the place we landed, is actually guy does his uh, upkeep on his property, like really, really nice. And the people around are really nice too. I had a hard time actually docking it today. That's another thing. Like the winds were so strong, and the current was so strong that I was, I kept coming in at like a forty-five degree angle, and it's a pretty tight spot. So. Luckily, my my neighbor Parker guy, like parking his boat there, like he uh, he was there, so I was just like, "Here, like take the rope," you know. He's like, "Here, kid, put down your homework and put down that video game and come park my boat." <laughs> 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 no, it went pretty well though. Everything's going pretty well. I'm uh, I'm pretty happy. As long as the mechanics hold up, I'm not too worried about the piloting. I gotta be honest. If we're gonna take up five minutes doing updates on Corey's boat, there's got to be like some dings involved because. Yeah, I love, I, think, that, I love that you you guys are safe and all, but it doesn't make for good radio. We we were on the yeah we were on the Star Wars news there. I think this is probably going to get chopped at this point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll see. Anyway, Colin Trevorrow was talking to Fandango, and he was asked uh, about his perspective about catering to kids. So the question from Fandango went like this: So you're about to make a Star Wars movie. Is that something that you think about? How much you're going to influence this younger generation? Handing them a movie and an experience they may cherish for the rest of their lives? And Trevorrow replied, It's how it was with us growing up. Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Princess Leia were all characters that we were able to identify with in various ways, and especially with the character of Rey and what she, she means to young girls right now and the challenges that she's up against. It's extremely crucial that I understand what actual children are feeling about these stories that we're telling them. And I think it's important that I have kids, and if filmmakers don't have kids, they should go talk to them, because they don't see things the same way that we did when we were kids. So yes, I am very dialed into that, because I think it's a requisite of the job. So what do you you guys make of this? Does this make you feel happy that he's looking to kids uh, to help tailor the movie, or do you get sort of the the feeling, oh no, this this is going to be the Phantom Menace all over again. Corey, what do you think? Well, I think the most important thing to take away from it here is that he said it's kind of like a prerequisite for the job. And I think that's more or less the the general theme of this here. You know, like, granted, I like I get what he's saying. Like, Star Wars for us growing up as kids meant a lot. But looking back, George also said that it was, you know, a movie for kids, but I don't think it like it was, but adults were really able to lose themselves in the mysticism as well. But it is important to have a perspective from a kid's mindset when it comes to Star Wars, because it is one of those things that in, like it captures our imagination, our, our imaginations when we're young. You know, it, it teaches us the clear and cut definition between good and evil. You know, stuff like that, like, it's fine. And I get that. It's it's great to have kids' opinions on movies of this genre anyhow. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think it's any reason to set off any alarms or anything, you know? James, what do you think? Sound the alarms, frankly. (laughs) (laughs) Truly beautiful the mind of a child is, no? Um, Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm torn. I see both sides. On the one hand, I, I'm like, yeah, that's good. Be, you know, get feedback and be open minded, and it's it, it can it can be a good thing to want what the, you know to do what the fans want. On the other hand, a big part of me is like, what kind of stupid way to make a movie is that? Like, either you have a story you you want to tell, or you don't. And so, like, part of me doesn't like the, you know that the, you know the, if it's over tailored. Uh, or you know they don't know where it's going because they're they're gonna leave it up to to see what every how everybody feels because there's there's a bunch of expressions but like if you try to please everybody, um you know it doesn't work out for for anybody in the end. 
And I think that's definitely a danger if you, if you, if, if you don't have some at least really strong ideas as a baseline to what to where you want the story to go. I don't mind if you tailor the, the details. Um, but yeah, they should at least have a strong idea as to where they think think this this show this boat is headed. Yeah, well, I mean, I interpreted this as not that I'm looking to kids or my kids or anybody else's kids to shape the story, but to how can I make this accessible and digestible for kids? That's that's what I took out of it. Maybe I'm reading it completely wrong. It's it's hard to see exactly what he means without hearing the whole interview or hearing the audio from it. Uh, but for for me, I mean, getting kids into Star Wars is well, he said it's a requisite of the job, and I, I tend to agree. It's 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 critical. It's essential to the franchise. And I think if you're going to bypass kids to cater to us as you know middle-aged guys who grew up with the movies and who uh, came, at, uh, many many fans came to believe that the movies ought to have evolved with them, and that's why a lot of fans were so pissed with the prequels. Um, uh, to me, you you may as well roll the whole thing up and and call it a day because. This will be controversial, but Star Wars will die on the vine if it doesn't inspire kids or trigger that sense of fun, wonder, and imagination that it did for us as as when we were kids. Like if that doesn't happen for kids now, then twenty, thirty years from now, Star Wars will be forgotten except for us old folks in the old in, in the homes, you know? Oh, hundred percent. Like that's it. They gotta they gotta reinvigorate and capture the imaginations of this youth, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, that's it. It's, you got to make, to me, that, that, that's right where I thought Trevorrow was going, is that these movies have to be easily consumable for kids. And like I said, when I, you know, I sent a sound clip over to Gen X-Wing when they were doing their, their 40th anniversary uh, special, that what's great about Star Wars is that it's, it's like an onion, that on the surface, it's you know, black and white, good and evil, very simple story that you know, built around uh, really common themes that we've told as stories for thousands of years, but with really striking visuals. But then as you peel the layers of the onion, you get a little bit deeper and see sort of the uh, deeper in- intricacies of the storytelling. And that's where as adults we go, oh man, this is so much cooler than I ever thought as a kid. I never understood why how this and that worked as a kid. I just waited for the bad guys to get killed. And I think Trevorrow is kind of getting towards that. How can I make it work on multiple levels? Instead of just, because I'm sure he's he's perfectly capable of making it work for you and me, but how does he make it work for his kids? That's I, I think that's the big question, and I you know I've never saw anybody ask Ryan Johnson the same question, because to me his movie looks like the one least catered or accessible to kids. And of course we haven't seen it yet, but just on, from what I've read and what I've seen, I don't, I don't know if you guys agree, but his seems to be the one that might be the most heady of of the movies yet what do you guys think well yeah i think that's we've said that almost since the prior to the force awakens right like it's the middle story it's the empire of this saga it's gotta yeah be a little... I'd, I'd say rogue one is as the spinoff too is sort of maybe an outlier in terms of of uh hitting the kids market i think there's a lot of movies star wars movies that that do better um but yeah yeah, that yeah that you're you're right, James. Rogue One does not do much for the under ten year old set. I don't think. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's probably once once you hit twelve years old, I think that's when it really gets it going. For I think the it hits of- hard on on the teenage. Yeah, that set 12, twelve to eighteen. I think it's it's you know smack dab perfect bullseye. But I think like it, it misses the mark a little bit for six eight eight year olds. Yeah, like the, the sense of eight fun to wasn't 12. there. 8 to 12, I could see kids getting into that. At least when we were kids, anyhow. I know the times have changed there, but uh, yeah, between 8 and 12, we would have been reenacting that story big time. Yeah, I mean, you might be right. Anyway, so uh, I'm, I'm relieved. I mean, just to wrap up on the kids thing, I'm especially with, with Ray. I'm glad that he's got his eyes open and is especially zoned in with Ray here. Uh, she's she's critical in for so many ways, not just to the story of Star Wars, but as as sort of a uh, iconic character and somebody who's who's like moving the needle in society for for uh, female protagonists. It's so crucial that he get her her arc right, and uh, he seems at least to be aware of 
his his responsibilities here, that which which makes me a little bit relieved. But uh, we'll move on to the second Trevorrow piece here. Uh, so his movie Book of Henry dropped last weekend, and it is getting torn apart, absolutely destroyed by critics and fans alike, to the tune of like twenty five percent on Rotten Tomatoes. It's getting crushed, <laughs> and uh, I I doubt that either of you guys have seen it yet, but. Uh, so, and I don't know based on these reviews if I ever will. And there's something to be said for seeing a movie for yourself before, um, you know, adopting what the critics and fans say. But geez, this one is coming back almost unanimous as as a big steaming pile of poo. Uh, but you know, ever ever since Trevor was named as the director of Episode Nine, we've all kind of had one eyebrow up at this guy, going, "Really? Because he made a popular dinosaur movie?" And then, of course, that wasn't the whole story uh he he got sing- singled out and selected because yes partially because he made a, a a great spectacular action-packed flick with jurassic world that made tons of money uh but also on the strength of his indie movie called uh, safety not Re- uh, safety not guaranteed so I don't, I don't know if the thinking was we'll give this guy uh, the benefit of the doubt because he can direct a blockbuster and he's also got the indie quirky thing going so Mash those two together, and voila, you've got episode nine, and it's going to be amazing. But people are scrutinizing his work. And before we get any deeper, um, should we be worried that his latest movie is a big pile of crap on, right before he's about to get into the director's chair for episode nine? I don't think so, because, um, well, I really, really loved the Lord of the Rings movies as some of my favorite ever. And I could find a thousand and one uses for my Hobbit CDs that uh, don't involve putting them in the DVD player. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. Uh, Corey, do you feel the same way? Say, say the question again, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Corey. Hey, no problem. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, we're talking about Colin Trevorrow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just I didn't I didn't hear the last that the the only part I didn't hear was the question. This is change. the second hijacking of the show. Uh, so should we be worried about Book of Henry, or Being should we terrible. be worried about episode episode nine because Book of Henry is apparently such a big pile of crap? It's tough to say. A little, a little. We all knew this film would be probably under an extreme amount of scrutiny. So there's that to take into consideration. And maybe again, Kyle, let's say it could be a case of uh, newsjacking where <laughs> yeah, everyone's oh, just like, Oh, well done. See, yeah. he, that was purposeful. He wanted to use that in his segment. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm on that same accord of Kyle. Like I'd like to see the fo- film first before kind of making any judgments. But in the same right, I did go ahead. Like I think it was last week or the week before I watched the trailer, I think twice or three times and, it's quite odd. It, the subject matter is very f- weird. Like, it's got... Uh, I don't know. Did you see the trailer, James? I haven't. And okay. Based on, based on the re- reviews, I may not see the movie, but... Well, anyhow, I know, like, uh, to me, it doesn't really matter. Like, the directors... I don't like everything every director's made, except maybe maybe Clint Eastwood. I don't know if he's ever made a bad movie. But, it, yeah, some some guys, you know, lay some eggs, and or, you know, not everything's to your taste, and that's not a problem for me. Well, just the, the subject matter in short, it's just basically like the super genius boy who kind of like such such a nice kid finds out his neighbor's being sexually abused. Uh, the cops won't do anything or they can't do anything because this guy's like like the, the bad guy's like too smart. And the kid decides to take it upon himself to do something about it with his mom. And he's kind of telling his mom everything to do because he's like this super genius boy, you know, but. So again, like right there, the subject matter is quite odd. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that he stayed with a project like this once having known that he was doing episode nine. Well, he'd, he'd been working on this movie for like 10 years. It, it was a passion project for him. This was, this was his baby. I mean, he didn't write it. So some of the blame, I'm sure, lies with the screenwriter and the story maker himself. But ultimately, the director always gets the credit or blame. Um, but anyway... I, I agree that, yeah, you most of the time a director is going to have ups and downs in his career. I mean, let, let's look at, you know, a little closer to home, Irvin, Irvin Kirshner, who directed, for, for most people, who might be the best Star Wars movie ever and maybe never will be topped in Empire. 
but he also directed a steaming pile of crap called Robocop 2. This was after Empire, so a director's path is not linear. As James, you talked about Peter Jackson. He got a lot worse <laughs> after, um, well, you, you could probably say after Fellowship, right? I, that's totally what I think, yes. So things have been sliding downhill for Peter Jackson ever since then. The more um, of himself he puts in his movies, the, the worse they are. Like I like when he's really, really super respectful and afraid to piss off fans, like he was at the beginning of, of the Fellowship movie. See, my, my, my main thing that I've been thinking about recently is, you had touched upon it earlier, Kyle, why Trevorrow? Like, what is he bringing to the table here? And, you know, the only one thing I can kind of throw at the wall, and maybe it's going to stick or not, you guys probably aren't going to like this, but the one commonality I've seen so far that I kind of pieced together myself was uh, looking at that movie, Safety Not Guaranteed, and Ryan Johnson's Looper, like, they both have to do with time travel. <laughs> like, that's the one commonality I can find between the two scripts. Like, the only reason... I can't see... Uh, why he would have landed this film if the only reason I could see him landing it is if he had a really good idea or you know like Kyle said the just because he made a wicked dinosaur movie that like raked in tons of money is he like owed some kind of favor after that by studio heads like I'm I'm not sure well I, I think that buys you some for some reason that buys you credibility in Hollywood it's you bank ability. Big... You got to understand, yeah. investors aren't artists. They don't. They, they just want to see a piece of paper with like basically what they consider to guarantee numbers. And you say, you know, this name brings in this much money, and you know, the, this studio brings in this much money, and this time frame with this investment will give you this much return. And that's all they want to see. The investors. They don't. So yeah, once you bank a few big movies, that is huge weight when it goes to to landing new jobs. I'm I'm sure of it. I, I, I would totally agree with that. Totally. But Kathleen Kennedy saw something in this guy. I, I, I'm not privy to that, and I've not seen his movie, so I don't know what that is. Um, the common thought seems to be that Safety Not Guaranteed is the sort of the artsy side of him, but he, I don't see... I, I see split opinion on that, and the further down the path we go here, the more that path widens towards people who say it's it's a great indie flick, and those who say... It, there's nothing there. It's kind of quirky and cool, but really it's it's just a lot of st uh, style. There's not much substance there. Uh, but we'll go a level deeper here because we, we can talk all day about directors who have gone up and down in their career. I mean, uh, Spielberg did some crap before he hit Jaws. Jaws and then Raiders of the Lost Ark and Close Encounters. You could argue that was his peak. And then you know, he's, he's done some up and down since then. We could probably do that e. all day. Uh, E.T., yeah, I mean, like the early days of Spielberg, that's quintessential Spielberg, right? And he's done so much more since. And some of it's good and some of it not quite so good. You're right. Um, but now this, this has now gone a level deeper. And this is where it gets a little bit touchier that people are scrutinizing his work and finding that throughout his movies, Colin Trevorrow, every single one of them uh, is... Really troubling elements in his handling of women characters. And that's from his debut movie in Home Base all the way through to Book of Henry. Uh, people are pointing out, you know, and backing it up with opinion, uh, not with opinion, but uh, well thought out pieces about why. Here, here's how this guy just can't write and handle female characters. And a lot, most of what I've read is sounds very reasonable. Again, not having seen his movies. I can't make an argument, but it sounds right. And I'm not going to tell, uh, you know, somebody who far better versed in women's issues than I am, than I am, that you're wrong, you're overreacting, you're seeing things that you just want to see so you can complain. I'm not going to do that. Um, so Corey, you do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can't comment too, too much. I haven't seen a lot of his earlier works and whatnot. Um, reading this article, there was one that was kind of a bit of a slap in the face about it was kind of a biased article. I'll say it that way. They really like the things they were pointing out. I mean, anyhow, either way we heard touching back on the beginning of what we were talking about that he's got, 
you know, we were t- he, was t- he was talking about his plans for Ray, more or less, and how kids, you know, want to envision Ray and whatnot. So it- it's on his mind. Uh, again, the track records making me a little skeptical again, and making me question Disney's decision a little. But uh, you know, I, I got to go with it. Okay, so here's the question. Okay, so. Because given the stakes in episode nine, not only does he have to close off Ray's arc in a satisfying and appropriate way, but he's also got to deal with Leia. And these are the two most key characters in Star Wars history, and they're being handed to a guy with a spotty track record of making quality movies and a very questionable record of handling women. So, I mean, we're going to kick this around. What do you do if you're Lucasfilm? So you you have a couple options because fandom is panicking and I don't I, I imagine this is making the rounds a little bit at the upper levels at Lucasfilm, but I don't know what they're gonna do about it. So do you stay the course? It's too late to make a big change now in removing Trevorrow from the project, and let's face it, it would be a massive PR nightmare to yank him off the project now. Massive. It would push episode nine all the way back until Christmas, most likely, if you wanted a good movie. And it would it would raise some serious questions about Kathleen Kennedy, about why did you pick this guy in the first place? None of this stuff was a secret. You could have, why didn't, why now? Why are you pulling the plug now? Uh, so you can stay the course because it's it would become a disaster. Uh, stay the course, option two, because the whining in fandom is unfounded. Trevorrow is clearly talented. And Kathleen Kennedy is clearly smarter than all of us combined. So. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> or option number three, make the move. Pull the plug on Trevorrow. Make a tough call, but his body of work is... There's too many red flags. And letting him handle the final chapter of Ray's arc and Leia's curtain call, it's too important to leave to chance. So end it and find somebody who can deal with it better. And especially in a... In a now post Wonder Woman world, where it's now possible that you can have uh, a woman protagonist and have a good movie come out of it. What are you guys doing, uh, James? You, you made it clear. Stay the course because the whining is unfounded. I, I don't know if you want to call it whining. It's like it's normal. It's a normal amount of panic. It's like every time I hear someone say something like the word gray, I go into this like protective, you know papa bear mode where i'm like don't don't touch my ot but like it's normal i think there's you know this guy's attached to something everyone cares about and you know he laid an egg so it's i don't i'm not even gonna call it whining i just think i i just don't see any reason to panic about it Corey, what what are you doing uh well i think we've disney's already had their chance at this right i think uh, Oh, oh, oh 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 yes well hey you didn't hear you hear what i had to say yet you know, yeah. Go ahead and finish it by saying, "I like the merry go Last time, the the the, con- the contract thing didn't go through last time, so maybe this won't either. I don't know. But jo- <laughs> Josh Josh Trank, I think, or I think that's his name, right? Correct. He was originally scheduled to do episode nine, if I'm not mistaken. No, he was doing a Boba Fett movie. Oh, was he? Eh? One of the standalones. Okay, yeah, you're right. But still, you know, he tanked with Fantastic Four and was just like kind of ripped away from him. <laughs> uh, you know, well, he was the- having all kinds of erratic behavior on the set of Fantastic Four, and it was this, and it was much earlier in the development of of the Boba Fett movie, way earlier. So Lucasfilm had time to pull the plug. No, you're right. They, I mean, they, they, they had more than enough time. The time this crunch is late is in there. the game, big time. The time crunch is here. I don't think. Uh, first of all, you do that. Uh, this guy's career is probably going to take a pretty big hit. His future is going to be questionable within the industry, I would think. Uh, Lucasfilm, they went for him for a reason. Like you said, like they got to stick to their guns here unless he asks to be dropped from the project, which I don't think is going to happen either. If he asks, then yeah, then they should do something about it. But like you said, Kyle, it's late in the game. It's not going to happen at this point, I don't think. Uh, maybe what they'll do is give him a little more support in regards to what's happening now. Uh, something really weird about what's... You brought, you said this to me, Kyle. I always thought that they had... James mentioned this earlier. I thought there would be a general storyline for 789, but it doesn't seem like that's the case and that each 
director and writer has got to run within the direction they so see fit. So him having this awesome idea prior to, you know, all these films coming out and pitching it to Lucasfilm and whatnot, you know, Kathleen Kennedy probably said, oh, yeah, this is amazing. And now since then, there's there's been quite a few things that have obviously affected and changed his story now. So it's going to be interesting to see how he deals with it. And uh, all this stuff that's come to light recently has definitely put him under the microscope a lot and just built the pressure up probably. I mean, The Last Jedi isn't even out yet, man. We still got like <laughs> six, seven months for that, and we're like freaking out about episode nine. It's well, if it's you're gonna something. freak out about it, it's now or never. So we we got to get our freak out out now. No, I think they either way they got to stay the course like you guys and just offer him whatever additional support he may need to to get the project done. You know, like even if he says, you know, like I, I'm about to tap out, guys. Like no, like we'll keep your name on the project and all that stuff. Just. You know, we'll, we'll help you write it. Well, whatever it is you need, we'll, we're going to get through this yeah, together kind of deal. He's not tapping out. There's he's there's no way. I, I can't imagine anybody taps out on these projects. Um, well, I, I'm, kind, I, well, I'm mostly with you guys. Like, I'm not worried about the varying quality of his movies. Like, Book of Henry got a crap review. Uh, Jurassic World is, is hit and miss. Uh, safety not guaranteed. They have fans. They have detractors, each of them. I'm not worried about that. But I am worried about the how he ha- seemingly handles women characters. I I'll, I'll, I will be so disappointed. And I've made my thoughts clear on Leia. I, I don't want her bungled. And I definitely don't want Ray bungled either. And I, Have you considered and, that if, if, um, if you look at most directors' repertoires, you could probably end up saying the same thing. Um, and, and maybe given like a movie where you have such an important character... You, you, you'll get different work from this guy because maybe he just hasn't had a script where the female character has been so important. And that is so common amongst, you know, many, many, many scripts. What's the test called? The I always want to call it the Bechamel test, but that's a delicious The, the Bechdel. Test. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Bechdel you know, test. That, that's true of so so many directors that I think, I think that the, this storyline is so different than most movies that it, that – worries me less than than uh, than it would if you know well, Ray it's, hadn't it's already been like established. It, when we go back we go back to the piece about uh his thoughts on kids <clears throat> it sounds like he's keenly aware of of the importance of Ray's character which which brings a little bit of ease to this for me anyway yeah um it sounds like he's very focused on the character that's great but i mean let's not forget i mean and this is again this is controversial but padme in the prequels by part 3 she was relegated to you know, basically barefoot and pregnant. They had taken a, a strong character from the Phantom Menace who took charge, uh, a strong senator in Attack of the Clones, and by the end, she was a tool. And, and again, this and this is where it, it's a it's a real hot take. Leia as well in in Jedi. Name one thing she does in Jedi that that's important to the galaxy. She shoots that stormtrooper in the face. <laughs> uh i'm still waiting yeah it's fair nothing she does nothing i mean she gets stripped naked you know it's the fantasy of every kid our age uh the gold bikini she frees han that's it and you can make the argument that lando should have freed han because he was already there why didn't he do it instead of bringing in more and more of the rebellion's top people he's already there just do it there's there's Leia did nothing in Jedi. Her her arc was stunted, for lack of a better word. Uh, so to have that happen a third in a third trilogy would, well, oh boy, that would do some serious damage to Star Wars. I think. Uh, so I think it worked for. I'm not gonna. Don't get me wrong. I would have liked to. Have, you're kind of spelling it out for me there, but I kind of liked Leia's tra- transition into that the character she became in Jedi, where she was a lot. Like, I know what you mean, that she was objectified and whatnot, being Jabba's palace and all that, and a bit put on the back burner, but it seems at that point, Leia had kind of, like, she chilled out a bit, you know? Like, and the other ones, she was just, like, so gung-ho, you couldn't, like, But Han that's what makes you... Leia great. The first thing, whenever you talk about Leia, that what, what's Leia? She's a strong, fiery, uh, spirited leader. That was yeah, but... gone in Jedi. There was none of that, period. That's not true. It was still in her eyes, and, like... Oh, she, come it, on. She did nothing. It's... She She did nothing. But 
I like she the followed fact along. That you you can't be like that your whole life. You can't be that like, that scene where they're in space and like Han tries to get a little closer and she's like basically like leave me alone. You know, like you can't always be that reclusive person. Like in this one, it seems like she just matured when she's on Endor kind of, you know, she... Nah, come on. By, by, look, in, in The Force Awakens, she's she's the strong leader again. In Bloodline, she's the strong leader. In Jedi, she she got hosed. Plain and no, simple. I, she's still a leader in that movie, but I, I get what you mean. She was kind of put on the back burner compared to the other characters. Like General Solo was in charge of that mission. She should have been in charge of that mission. She's the like the top ranking person there. I'll, anyway, I, I, I don't want to derail too far into this all i'm saying is that her arc was stunted as was padme's in the prequels it was and they're all kind of in service of uh the the male leads and i get that that's what the story called for but you can't afford to do that this time around so if there's any for me there's any worry but with trevorrow it's it's that and it's only that uh but it's you can't pull the plug on him now it's it's a nightmare uh, I I don't think it's totally warranted, and like you said, Corey, I think the key thing is support for the guy. And I I don't know how involved Kathleen Kennedy will be at this point because for sure she's she's seeing this. This is making the rounds now at, at Lucasfilm. I think the PR department is probably sniffing through Twitter and going, "Oh shit!" Yeah, they're huge fans of the tumbling saber. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, but anyway, like no, nobody wants to have their boss looking over their shoulder. So I can't imagine she's in there daily with them with, pen, you know, pen and paper in hand, but I'm sure there's a closer working relationship on this, this rewrite, especially in light of Carrie Fisher's death. Exactly. So I'm with you guys. I'm not, I'm not panicking. You know, I went on a, for a while, but I'm not panicking. You got to stick with Trevaro, but you, the, the support has to be there and there's got to be, I think, um, a heightened awareness and infrastructure around how this script gets done. You just, you simply can't afford to screw it up because people are like Kathleen Kennedy will wear, will wear the goat horns if it gets screwed up and as will Colin Trevorrow, but Kathleen Kennedy will take a big hit if this gets screwed up. Yeah, I would think so too. I mean, in the end, it all boils down to trust, right? Like what has Colin Trevorrow done to earn the trust of having to close off this trilogy? I don't know. But, you know, show us that show show us why you were you were picked. And I think that's all fans really want. All right. That's it for Colin Javaro. Um Mark Hamill was also in the news this week, uh, quickly walking back those comments he made to Vanity Fair about his fundamental disagreements with every choice Ryan Johnson made for Luke in The Last Jedi. He's kind of rephrased that now to... He sounds PR. You want me to take this one? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. My, my throat's starting to irritate me a bit here. Hamill quote. <clears throat> I got in trouble because I was quoted as saying uh, to Ryan that I fundamentally disagree with everything you decided about Luke. And it was inartfully phrased. What I was was surprised at how he saw Luke. And it took me a while to get around to his way of thinking. But once I was there, it was a thrilling experience. I hope it will be for the audience, too. Um, it just sounds super pro. Like, that's just the right thing to say. And Hamill's always been a super, you know, pretty pretty damn professional. So I'm, I'm not at all surprised. It, it, but behind it all, I think he didn't like it at the beginning. I think, I think underlying it all, it's obvious that he didn't really like it right away. He can phrase it however he wants, but he didn't like it. Yeah, I, I think it's... 100% clear. Like when he talks about um, The Force Awakens when they were doing the, the first script read through, he was like, okay, now Luke's going to come in. Oh, now Luke's going to come in. And he never did. And Luke never had his moment until the very end. And he was like, what? That's it? So he disagreed with Luke's handling there for sure. And he's, he's even gone on record as saying that there should have, like Luke should have been in The Force Awakens with Han and Leia. And they should have had that, that big nostalgic adventure together. Um, but I think in The Last Jedi, he probably thinks Luke should be like you know, the dashing, debonair, elder hero and the one who's going to swoop in to save the day. And it seems very clear that Luke isn't going to be that guy. And I think that's what Hamill's disagreeing with. But he's, he's, if he's given in and he's doing his job as a, as a professional actor and he's just bringing Ryan Johnson's vision to life. 
Uh, so honest mistake on his part, and he it's it's all good, or uh, is he doing damage control and he's still pissed off? I think it's it's a bit of damage control too because you know even I watched the interview uh, that was part of that link and he even said he's like he even said there somebody the reporter like oh because of you guys like uh, I got in trouble like uh, I got a slap on the wrist kind of you know and he says so, too the way he he words it he says it was inartfully phrased he didn't say that's not what I meant he just said I could have said it nicer yeah kind of I I get you and it's just picture that it's like oh no 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 like paging Mr Hamill. <laughs> like we need we need to have a little chat with your agent. Yeah, speak to my agent. But oh, uh, do you, do you, are you suggesting that somebody at Lucasfilm called him up and said, "Hey, dude, tone it down," or do you think he's just sort of seeing the tweets on Twitter and going, "Uh oh." No, he clearly said it on that uh, in that interview that he, he kind of got in a bit of trouble. I I would think that yes, Lucasfilm, whoever it was, did say something like, hey, bro, like, turn it down. This is a film that you're a part of, and this is more than yourself. I, I didn't you know? take it that way that he got in trouble. I think he, I, I took it more as like I stirred the pot. Like, by the reaction I'm seeing, I caused trouble. It's possible. It could go either way. That, yeah, that's kind of the way I saw it. Like, he, he said something, you know, I disagree with how you handled Luke, and fans panicked a little bit. And well, so, so, it, someone recently even tweeted that at, at Ryan Johnson saying, hey, like even uh, Mark Hamill thinks that what you did with Luke is no good and blah, 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 blah. And Johnson replied to the tweet, tweet saying, imagine how I felt. Yeah. And again, what a pro answer, right? Yeah. Imagine imagine being sitting, you're, you're the director who's been a Star Wars fan your whole life. And here you have Mark Hamill sitting in front of you going, dude, what are you doing with Luke? This is my character and this is what you're doing with him. I completely disagree with this. Gulp. Well, that's that's the whole thing. Like, I, this is what I have here. This is like the basis of my my notes here, and you kind of already spelled it out a bit, Kyle. Is what we really need to do, and what I'd like to hear a reporter ask Hamill is, okay, knowing what we know now, you ask him. So, Mark, what did you originally envision for the character Luke in this saga? Like, why is what now you then you kind of figure out why what Ryan Johnson's doing with the character is so different. And Kyle said it is he debonair, whatever. Like, in Mark. Uh, Mark Hamill, he knows what happened in the events of The Force Awaken, uh, the Jedi Temple, the the history behind Star Wars, like uh, the lore behind it. He's He knows of it. He, he's a part of it, right? Like he's obviously taught these things. So, you know, he could have thought of it in two ways, like Kyle said, as he think of himself as this super smart or like all-knowing Jedi, or he is he really this guy at this point that's kind of weak? lost uh waiting uh, i know none of us want to see this and i'm not saying that's the f- way the film's gonna go but you know like uh, when ray meets him is he really all powerful and just ready to like whip ass or is he gonna take some time to get back into the swing of things is he gonna be like a, a rusty old jedi like is he gonna be like really crappy at the beginning maybe you know well, I, I think he's going to be reclusive, hesitant, and and probably like mournful. I think that's the portrayal of Luke that's coming. And I, but I is, think is that going to hold him back though? Like, has he been training this whole time on Act Two and like honing his skills, or has he kind of let them slip a bit? Like you said, and he's no rusty. Nah, he's, they he's don't slip. Be, they don't slide. Not Luke. I mean, this is, Luke is probably going to end up being as powerful a Jedi as we've seen. I would hope so. I think he's just going around with a heavy heart and and doesn't want to fight anymore. I think that's that's what we're going to see, and I think that's what Luke or Mark Hamill was taking issue with. Okay, that's it. Anybody else want to chime in on this before we uh, jump into listener questions? James can read. No, I don't. Yeah, I can read. I told you. <laughs> you know what I did all week is I just prepped for the show. I just read that. That Hamill quote, like that's the 740th time I've read it this week. The heart and soul is there, man. We get it. <laughs> uh, listener questions is the way to go. This is my favorite part of the show every single time. Yep, absolutely. So uh, let's let's get into it. Let's start off with ads edition. Hello, chaps. Episode 80. Wow. Um, so a couple of questions uh, this week. Uh, the first one is taking the Disney film uh, Wally. Do you think there could ever be a Star Wars standalone film predominantly about a astromech 
or robot. And then the second question, far more controversial, and I am certainly not saying I want this to happen. It's more a question for you guys to kick around with. So, a Star Wars musical. A few years back, they tried to do this with Lord of the Rings. I'm not sure it was ever as successful as they thought it might be. So, rather than should they do it, because I think I know what your answers are going to be, let's say they're doing it. So, how should they do a Star Wars musical? So I can't wait to hear you guys discuss this, uh, and it's also really good to hear all the listener questions that have been coming in uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, long may it continue. The show is brilliant. Uh, it's come such a long way. I uh, can't believe you're at 80 episodes now. Um, so keep up the great work, and I will catch you next week. Take care. Bye. And there goes Ads. Thank you, Ads, so much for the kind words, and uh, th- thank you f- I guess from the bottom of our hearts for being such an intrinsic intrinsic part of this show. You know, we're three guys here just bantering about Star Wars, but really this is a four-person show. Ads has been in it for months and months now, going back to I don't even know what episode. Um, so when you when you think of the tumbling saber, you also got to think of ads, and I'm sure everybody who's been listening for a while certainly does. So uh, thanks, ads. Uh, yeah, really. happy Father's Day, ads. Yeah, absolutely. So true. And 80, 80 episodes, guys. That, that's a big number. 80. Holy that's shit. Nice. It's nice and round. Rolling rolling here. You know, what a pirate would, you know what a pirate would say if it was his birthday today? <laughs> I'm 80. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> the hits keep on coming. Oh, God. We you know if, if you factor in uh, Sith Disturbers and Journals of the Willing, we, we've done way over 100 podcasts. That's true. Uh, we're just Doesn't count though. Here. No, no, no. Our our one hundredth is going to be a few weeks before the last Jedi. Anyway, so ads first question: a Star Wars standalone movie in the spirit of Wally with a droid. Corey, what do you think? Uh, I do like it. I think it has lots of potential. It's a really, really interesting question. Uh, do I think? Lucasfilm is going to tackle that subject matter anytime soon? No. But again, a lot of uh, a lot of fodder there for a nice cool story. Uh, take it, kind of take it in any direction. Uh, the Clone Wars did a small arc of about there's about four episodes based upon a group of droids, a group of Astromechs and it was actually quite good. With so neighbor Gaskin? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was such a strange arc I on that that's... planet that was all like completely white. Who is? I think that's St- is that Steven Stanton? It is. Yeah. It is, eh? Yeah, that's amazing. I love that character. Yeah, he's good. He's kind of uh, yeah, he's an interesting character. So, so James M- Mieber Gaskin is a a uh, general in the Republic in the Clone War eras. Think of a upright walking bullfrog that speaks like the drill sergeant from Full Metal Jacket. <laughs> All right, I got you. Yeah, and his, <laughs> he's awesome. His his office or his command center is inside the head of a droid or an astromech. It's it's it quite the uh, unique novel little arc. But yeah, now that was Steven Stanton. By the way, that was it was a fun little arc, but uh let's face it, the astromechs and the droids of this saga, this series, Star Wars, they're really overlooked a lot of the time because they're always there in the clutch. They always come through. They can be considered some of the truest of heroes in this story. So like R2, it just seems like he's one of those, it's almost like he's like, he's like that dog, like Lassie's that's just so smart that he's totally on the same wavelength as you are even above that. Like he's two steps ag- ahead of the game kind of, you know? So there's that angle you could take on it. And like, like I said, they're, there's lots of interesting story arcs that you can take with that, like them coming uh, to get their free will, whatever it is, you know, like it, it's an interesting thing. I don't, again, I don't think they'll do it. And if they do do it, I would like to yeah, do do an animation would be cool. You know, a nice Disney Pixar Star Wars crossover, maybe. Was that a save? Did you did you save yourself with the Disney comment by th- wrapping in Pixar and Star Wars and all that? 
Sure. No, he didn't because it would still be a Lucasfilm Lucasfilm at all. Yeah, you didn't (sighs) mention Lucas. Okay, that's that's another two dollars. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. (laughs) We're going out soon anyway, right? (laughs) Supposed to be this week. Supposed to be tomorrow, and supposed to be smoked meat. You dummy. (laughs) 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 Nothing was decided last I saw. I was all like, "We'll discuss." That's all I said. (laughs) Oh man, that's amazing. You were talking about a Star Wars movie, and you mentioned every part of the company except Lucasfilm. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'd like to say you were doing it on purpose, but I don't think you did. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's incredible. Uh, James, what do you think? Do you think there should be a, a droid standalone movie similar to Wally? Uh, hey, first of all, I mean, have we seen? Have we all seen Wally? Yes. We love Wally, right? Yeah, I, movie, I, I quite enjoyed Wally. Yeah, I mean it's terrific. Um, but I'm going to say no, even though I really liked Wally. That Wally was has already been made, um, and I, I, I'll loophole it and say like I could see them doing a standalone movie where a droid was like one of the main characters, like maybe Cassian and K2SO. I could see that movie being made. Um, but a standalone where it's just you know about a droid or a couple of droids. Mm, I don't see it happening. I don't know. I don't know if I want to see it happen necessarily either, until they knock off a, a whole bunch of other higher priority movies for me. I'm gonna echo that, James. Uh, I say you're not gonna do a, a Wally style movie simply because of the plagiarism you'll be accused of from your your parent company. Like you, like you said, Wally's been done, so don't do it again, especially since you're owned by the people who did Wally. Um. But I can see, and I think they probably should do so. Ads, this is this is this is on you, man. You should take credit for this. Um, an animated movie featuring a main cast of droids, and there will be periphery characters who are not droids. Uh, but I think you should limit the humans in this and make it primarily about the droids. Make it fun and light, and you know, an easy uh, storyline that I thought of in the Force Awakens. C three uh, art, yeah, C three PO is the head of the resistance uh, spy network consisting of droids across the galaxy. And we see the droid at Maz's castle. When that droid sends in the message that, uh, you know, Han Solo and Ray and Finn are all there at Maz's castle, he's, he's radioing C-3PO. That's sort of information like in the, the script or novel. Uh, so I could, I can totally picture a really fun and funny uh, droid movie with C-3PO, you know, struggling to set up this network with incompetent droids. And it would be hilarious, I think, to see him you know, going across the galaxy with R2, and, or not, R, I guess R2 wouldn't be part of it, uh, but with BB-8 and setting up this network of, of spy droids. I think there, there could be something cool there. And you wouldn't have to treat it like, oh, this is the movie for 2020. And everything's focused around that movie. I think you could just slip that in during the summer and still have a standalone movie come out that year. Like, it's just a, a, a bonus thing that year. I, I think that could and should happen. I, I like what you said there. I'm kind of exactly like I'm on the same page as, you know, you get four or five droids together and you make them the main characters. You have periphery characters and just go from there. Like, there's so many ways you could take this story and it could be light, funny, like you said. Uh, well, the, the th- C-3PO one-shot about the red arm. That I, I don't know if that was sort of a, a litmus test for that concept, but it, the tone was sort of off. It wasn't funny really at all. Whereas I think if you take a little bit of a comedic angle and slap it on to these droids, I think you've got a winner there. Frankly, I like how you threw BB in, BB in there at the last minute, BB-8. But uh, I was thinking, I kind of have here, would you guys ever want to see or, you know, in the future... I guess if they were going to tackle the subject matter, it would probably boil down to R2 and 3PO, no? A standalone probably. with R2 and 3PO? I probably. Mean... Well, you, well, you know what? That movie would be square aimed squarely at kids. And you know, I hate to say it, but BB-8's the new R2. We still love R2, and he's still our guy, and you run a poll, and all the time R2 comes back as the winner, but kids aren't voting in that poll. Right now it's BB-8, and I think that's the guy, that's the joy that gets built around in the future. Just my two cents, but I think that's, I think any movie that they did in this respect would be focused on BB-8 with C-3PO being that 
the narrator, so to speak. Well, at least there with the resistance. And remember that story we had heard a couple weeks ago where JJ tried to squeeze him into the into the Falcon with Ray and Chewie to go pick up Luke and leave R2 behind. Correct. Yep, no, that didn't make any sense. But uh And you know what? Uh, Carlos would love to see that movie. He'd be there opening day to see a movie led by C3PO, wouldn't he? You know, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, and the more I thought about it, the more and more I kind of, like, love 3PO. And I, I'm going to, like, you know, all the lists that we make and the favorites that we have and with listener questions, like, it's all fluid. It's always moving. And I got to give 3PO more love, man. Like, he really is a huge part of those movies for co- comedic relief. Like, he's there when you most need him, you know? It's like these tenses of situations, and then he's just there to panic kind of di- dis- disarm the the tension in a way you know like make you laugh in these situations where you're like oh my god you're so tense and then he says something and you're just like you're laughing you know like did you say disarm is a pun <laughs> <laughs> this leg this head <laughs> yeah no you're you're right i mean c3po is, is used to pretty pretty effectively as 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 a comedic tool throughout yeah, he's a tool. Yeah, he's a tool. No doubt. Uh, he is annoying, but I mean, I, we love everybody, right? The, I mean, I from the good guys to bad guys and everybody in between, you kind of love these people after a while, even though they're some of them are just total a-holes. Kylo Ren, I love him, but I hate him. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with ads in that I think there should be a droid standalone, but I don't think it should be... In the Wally style, I think we all kind of agree on that. I don't know if that'll be music to Ad's ears or not. Oh ho ho! I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well then, it's number two, a Star Wars musical. So Ad's had mentioned the Lord of the Rings musical. I was unaware of this. James, were you? Saw it. it wasn't very good. They had all kinds of they had all kinds of um, issues too with like technical issues at the show. I went to see it. Place des Are. Oh, you went to see it. Yep. And it was not good at all. Like, was it sort of a reenactment of the three movies? Uh, yes. And it was it not good at all. I wouldn't say it's not good at all, but it's it wasn't great. It was just okay. Interesting. So, I mean, what were you expecting going into it? Hmm. I actually like theater and even like musical theater. I've I've been to see Mamma Mia a couple of times. My, my wife particularly likes that one. Um, and I enjoy it. Like I don't mind musicals. Uh, so I expected it to be... I expected them, I think, to take a lighter tone. And they sort of did Lord of the Rings like, you know, as they were written. They tried to do like a one-for-one one copy? Yeah, well, an abbreviated copy for sure, like just just the 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 meat, or even maybe just the bare bones. But like, uh, it doesn't suit. It didn't to me. It was more like they, they did it like a Phantom of the Opera, where it was just too serious, and and it mm. is a serious not story for sure. But they could have done it in. A, I don't know. I don't know what I was expecting actually. To be to, okay, to be okay, fair, so- I don't I don't know how they could have pleased me. <laughs> well, apply that experience then uh, to this question. Lucasfilm is going ahead with this. How should they tackle it? Like, should they do the entire saga or segment by trilogy? Do a one like one for one copies or or zero in on a character? What do you do? I well, first of all, my answer is probably going to be really unpopular, but I would do it as a full fledged comedy. Like, if you if you're gonna do it, because I have to, because Ad said. They're doing it, so I just have to decide how. Um, I would do a full fledged like comedy. You ever see you ever see um, the pirate movie? I'm, I'm gonna be. N- no one's gonna know this, but if ever if anybody does, they're gonna be like, "Oh my god, yes! Oh my god, yes!" <laughs> For real, Corey? Yeah, my buddy Jimmy. He totally sent me this <laughs> link a couple months ago. He was all flipping out about the uh, this thing called the pirate movie. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway. It's it's super dated now, but like it's 
it's uh, it could it might as well be Mel Brooks. Um, it's but it's uh, that kind of musical where there's slapstick comedy and and in your face uh, uh, visual gags and you know the the, the music is is all uh, double entendre and innuendoed and I, I, if I'm if you're gonna do a Star Wars, I would do some, something along that line with maybe droids. Who knows? That that's really cool. I. I... I'm totally unfamiliar with musicals. I've never seen one. Um, not because I don't like them. I just, it's, it's it's not part of my thing. You know, I, I've i never seen one, so I don't know how they work or how the, to best address this. But I like what you said. I, I think taking a different slant, and instead of trying to just interpret the movie or the story and put put it on stage, which may fall flat because you would see the differences and where they don't work. Do something different. Do something comedic with the same story. I think that would be amazing. I think people would like it because the fan service you do would be well received, as opposed to like you did it wrong. You know, it's not working. Yeah, yeah. You have some latitude here to do something totally different and reinterpret some things and and get a laugh out of it. Because at the end of the day, it's it's not the story. It's just a re-envisioning of. Yeah, I, I took a I took a note here from James. Basically, you 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 basically loopholed has question in the sense of saying <laughs> insane droids, and that would be a really cool answer. You know, the point of view of droids, like a character driven story of the saga, solely through three PO and R 2s eyes, kind of you know, It'd be pretty a interesting. monologue, a three PO monologue. For, I've seen it. Candido. I've seen it. I've seen it live, bro. <laughs> Me and Kyle both went to uh, Star Wars in concert in like 2009. Uh, yeah, it was 2009, I think. Or 8. Either way, uh, Anthony Daniels hosted it. it was uh, He was the narrator. He was the host. Well, you know, that was supposed to happen again in 2016. It just didn't. Which is sad because that was it really just awesome. It went away. Oh, I'm, I, I'm there again whenever they do it. But the plans were in the works and then it just disappeared. And I By never way, got an answer. For, I, I asked a couple questions. What happened to this? Is it on ice? Is it dead? Is it coming back? Silence. I was quite insulted. Touching back on Ads' question, though, like Star Wars lends itself to this kind of thing. It's a, it's a space opera, right? So it could work really well in a certain sense. Although I... Like spoofing I don't know. it? Spoofing it would work really well. I have right away in my notes with an asterisk beside it. I have space pirates. Like I wish somebody like, would talk about a Star Wars spoof at some point. Well, James put the comedic aspect on it there, <laughs> but <laughs> right over his head. Well, are you talking about space balls again? I would catch it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, but I, I I like it. Like I I'm on the same page as James. Like I went to go see the Phantom of the Opera when I was young, and it, it is a little heavy, but. Yeah, to this day, I still love, I still have that memory pretty uh, well embedded in me. Yeah, like I think another good way to take it, again, character-driven story, you can probably maybe condense all six movies. So like the original six, okay? Character-driven story of Anakin, you know, just, you know, you got about what, an hour and a half, two hours? It'd be quick. You just really got to get the Coles Notes version of it. Well, you know, one of the things that I th- I thought of, you know, the, do you follow Depressed Darth on Twitter? Yeah, I think so. so. It's a pretty damn funny account. And I, I, I would love to see that Darth Vader put into a musical. That would be hysterical to me. And hopefully people listening understand or, or, or follow that Depressed Darth account and have been following it for a while so they get the gist of his tweets and, and, and the, the sense of humor. But I think putting that to to a uh, musical would be hilarious. But what about the Zuvio the musical? Yeah, mm. no. Gonk the musical. Gonk. Yes. Gonk the musical. Mm. Maybe a bit one note, but uh I'd still pay to see it. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. One note. George Lucas, the musical. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would be downright awkward. It would be pretty would cool. It... You see him like writing the script and like going crazy, mur- uh, making a new hope. 
Yeah, it would just be him like at a desk with like hunched over writing the stuff and then like the stage light would be his imagination and the, the scenes would act out in his head. Having palpitations. Pal- <laughs> palpit- palpitine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, I'm all for dads. Star Wars musical, do it. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I kind of have this written in my notes. I kind of feel like a bit of an idiot for it, but I wrote down like strictly on Broadway. Like, well, not you know, in a play theatrical version. I do not want to see a Star Wars musical, the movie. No, 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 like a like Moulin Rouge type thing, or Chicago. Yeah, exactly. No, no, that that need not apply. This is an, a, a theatrical, like a, on stage theater thing. I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, agreed. And before we let ads go, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up two quick points. First of all, the U.S. Open was was one uh, Sunday a couple days ago. By the time this gets out, uh, and congratulations to the winner Kepka. But uh, ads and everyone who who follows golf will probably agree that the U.S. Open should never have been played at a course that easy. That course was too easy um, for the U.S. Open. It, it it felt like any other weekend, and the U.S. Open is supposed to feel a bit different. Now, who won um, it? Uh, Brooks Kepka, really, is- really great player, young, athletic, sort of second tier, unknown until this weekend. A lot more people will know him now. Well, isn't this? I mean, I, you, you'll know more than me, but the blank number of U.S. Opens in a row that were won by a first-time winner. Uh, probably true. I'm trying to think. Last back-to-backs. Yeah, it's definitely been a few in a row, anyway. Interesting. But yeah, yeah. I, heard, I remember that as an early storyline of the U.S. Open that the, the players were just eating up the course. Yeah, and the U.S. Open typically is like the hardest tournament of the year, unless the winds or weather are really up at the uh, at the Open Championship, the, which we call the British Open here. Um, the U.S. Open, just because of setup, course condition, the rough being super thick and the greens being super fast, it usually, you know, sometimes over par wins. We won two over par wins the U.S. Open. And today, 16 under one, which is like the record low. Well, isn't that the thing about St. Andrews at, at the uh, British Open that sometimes it's impossibly difficult with the with the weather and the grass? And sometimes they go out and shoot, you know, 61. Well, never really in the open. I think the, the open record there is 63. I could be wrong. Someone will correct me. Um, but the other thing I wanted to bring up on golf ads and everyone else in Star Wars is I finally got that sensation you guys talk about when you find that that figure or whatever collectible um, you've been searching for, because I've been on the hunt for a 64 degree lob wedge for two and a half years since I lost the last one I had and could not find one anywhere. It was, t- you know, I, I was going to have one bent because I couldn't find a 64. I was going to buy another one and like adapt it, blah, blah, blah. And when I saw this 64 degree wedge last week, I, I, I felt like it was Christmas. I felt like I was five years old. And I thought of you guys, I was like, Oh, this is what it's like to find that figure. <laughs> yeah the thrill of the hunt man it is it's it's thrilling it was a real thrill yeah we got to get you into that james <laughs> no no no. i got enough addictions that's an, that's that's th- thank you but no thank you mm. ads mm. sir thank you very much thank you for being part of the show 80 episodes in uh long may it continue as you like to say thanks ads you the and man. As, uh, yeah see you next as week the pirate would say ads I'm 80. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> All right. Bradley's back this week with another question. Uh, I'll, I'll take this one, and Corey can get the next two. How about that? Okay. Let me just bring up the show notes here. Well, you, you got time. Don't stress. Let's do it. All right. From Bradley. Hey, guys. This week, I have two questions for your Star Wars pleasure. The first one is another get-to-know-you question. What lightsaber battle is your favorite and why? My favorite battle is Luke and Vader on Cloud City. The second, oh, and the second question I'll get to later, but let's let's do this one first. James, favorite Star Wars lightsaber battle? Favorite. It's that's the term because like favorite and best f- are two different things. They are, um, and I'd have to agree with him. But my favorite is probably is probably Vader and Luke. Maybe any time they meet, uh, every time they meet. But you know that that's probably not my answer. If if he would have said best, I would I probably would have gone Maul versus uh, two Jedi. Um, yeah, 
I have to, but I have to agree with Bradley. Um, yeah, there's something, so, something uber iconic and scary and exciting and to see the red and the green. Um, yeah, I'm on board. Corey? Uh, you know, again, this list is kind of fluid. This is a familiar question to me recently. Like, I'm not going to get into why, but, uh, I'm on the same page. You know, that Cloud City fight is the definitive Star Wars fight. Just because of the storyline and the movie itself, like everything surrounding the events, the Macquarie-esque visuals to it really lend itself to being the most iconic, I would say, you know, the I am your father moment, all that stuff. So definitely the best. Uh, just some other shout outs, though, like Duel, Duel of the Fates. Come on. That's, that's what we were all waiting for at that time in our lives. Like we knew we watched the movie at this point. We're getting toward the end of the movie. We know Jedi are super powerful. Let's see some Sith on Jedi action, and we did in a big, big way. Like, we waited for that, and that was a big payoff to that movie. When we saw the two-on-one there, it was just, that was an incredible fight. And like James said, too, the Jedi fight with Vader is pretty amazing. Recent fights, ah, Twilight of the Apprentice, come on, Ahsoka Vader. Visually, absolutely stunning. Emotionally, like, First time I saw it, I was just like in complete awe, like goosebumps. Like, well, that one, that it, one's gutting, right? Because you know Ahsoka can't win, so you're just nope. waiting for her to either die or somehow get away. Because you know she's not winning that fight. And everything they did in it, though, again, being in the temple, everything that was going on, Kanan being blinded at this point, uh, her chopping half his mask off, like it was just on like donkey kong at that point like i was so into it the first time i saw it like just as if i was in, entranced in the deepest part of any of the movies yeah no, no that's that's not that's a top three for me it's pretty it's probably it might even be number two right behind uh, i'll do the clean sweep it's it's luke invader on bespin it's just it's perfect cinema for me it's it's just so emotionally charged you know the the, the build up behind it Oh God, it's it's so good. The set design, like James, you alluded to it. Just the the color that they that they set forth, the palette there, it's incredible. Uh, John Williams' work underpins the whole thing. The payoff with with uh, I am your father. It's it's like I said, it's it's perfect cinema. It's just so good. And I'll, you know what? I'll tr- I, I will trade, you know, the the sizzle and flare and flash of. Duel of the Fates and Battle of Heroes, which are both good in their own ways. Uh, I'll trade that style and sub uh, flair for the the emotional resonance and the the storytelling of that fight on Bespin every time. And even yeah. if you want to go to, to Luke versus Vader 2.0, maybe not quite as cool, uh, but to see Luke get pushed to the brink and dabble in the dark side a little bit there. Uh, it's amazing. It, Luke versus Vader always ends up being incredible, except for the comic books. That's not good. But yeah, uh, Corey, you, you said it, Ahsoka versus Vader sneaks in there. I think most fans probably wouldn't consider that, but that's it's it's absolutely right there. It really is. You know what else is right there? It's kind Obi-Wan of Obi Wan Maul. <laughs> oh, uh, well, Obi Wan Maul it happened a few times, right? Yeah, the second time around, the one, two, three. Well, that that was that was I think round three because they went at it a couple times in the Clone, in Clone Wars, Wars. Right? yeah. And those are all okay, cool. They're going at it again. Um, Look, nobody picked Flippy Yoda. No, 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 not doing that. Uh, no, Palpatine versus Sav- uh, Savage and Maul. That was a really cool fight. I mean that was that one was just really cool. There's nothing like, oh my god, I can't believe the this how how resonant resonant this is. It was just really cool to see. It was, it's one of the most spectacular fights in Star It's one Wars. of those things it comes round again because you, we rarely get to see Palpatine fight, right? And at this point the movies had already all come out, but it was just our first chance in the Clone Wars to see Palpatine, you know, the 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 blades just come out from under the robe in both hands and him take on both brothers, and it's like, oh my god! And he just—he's oh, so powerful. Them both. He, he's so powerful. That's what's—they really beat that home at this point. To the fact that 
Maul is screaming at the end for mercy. Yeah, was that the season four or season five finale? Uh, four. I think you're right. Yeah, because five was was uh, Ahsoka leaving the Jedi Order. But yeah, that that was that's like super cool. It's almost a fan service fight. Like it's just something that oh, I'd love to see this, this, and that. Okay, let's do that and see how it plays out. And it was really cool. Uh, Bradley's second question. Moving on here. Uh, where was I at in the show notes? Okay, the second question is about The Last Jedi. I think it's safe to say we all want to see Luke use his Jedi powers and kick some dark side ass. Who would you rather see Luke fight? Supreme Leader Snoke, Snoke's Red Guards, I think they're the Praetorian Guards, uh, Kylo Ren, the Knights of Ren, or E, not fight at all. So Bradley continues, I've thought about this, and I think the best possible fight could potentially be Snoke, but I think I would rather see this fight take place in Episode 9. I feel like the fight with the Red Guards would be a cool visual, since we haven't seen any Red Guards in action. Kylo, I feel, wouldn't be a fight at all, so I wouldn't want to see that. The Knights of Ren intrigue me. Once again, I think there could be some cool visuals here, and seeing Luke's complete power on display would be awesome especially against a group of skilled mercenaries. I feel like Luke has to be up against two or more individuals for it to be an even challenge for him. Not seeing Luke fight at all, I feel would be a missed opportunity. That's, that's putting it gently. And would honestly frustrate me. And again, that's, that's putting it very, very gently. Um, that being said, it's a toss-up between B and D. So that would be Snoke's Red Guards and the Knights of Ren. Um... His final answer, Bradley's final answer is D, Knights of Ren. Really enjoying the show and looking forward to hearing your answers and would also and would love to see those who follow you on Twitter to tweet out who they would like to see Luke, uh, Luke fight. Take care and have a great show. And as always, may the force be with you. Cheers, Bradley. Bradley, thank you, sir. And everybody, you can follow Bradley at Bradley W. Hall on Twitter so you can, uh, you can let him know your answer. To this question but guys uh james i'll throw it to you first who do you want to see luke fight um i want uh, i want to see him fight everybody on the list frankly uh but who do i want to who do i think we'll see him fight first and who do i want to see him fight first again i i i, I have to agree with bradley i'm, I'm gonna say brad uh knights of ren but i'll say i think our first taste of his power is gonna be is, is gonna come from ray not that he'll fight her, but we will get a sense of like where he's at when he'll either put her in her place or, you know, she'll challenge him on something or at, at some point, I they, think they before could spar, he fights right? somebody. They could yeah, lightsaber uh, spar. Even if it is, even if it is just sparring. Um, yeah, I think we'll get a taste of his power before he fights anybody. Um, all right. So I'll, 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 I'll kick it around next. Uh, I'm again going to agree with you, James and with Bradley. The Knights of Ren, and Bradley laid out the, the reasons pretty uh, thoughtfully, I think. Snoke, I think, is a fight for nine. Uh, the Red Guards would be cool, but I, we don't know anything about those guys just yet. So I'm, I'm parking those guys. And maybe they're fodder for Rey at some point. And Kylo, I, I think Luke would mop the floor with Kylo, unless Kylo like you know threw flour in his eyes and cheated. Um, and again, like like I think Bradley's best point is... You need, like, Luke is probably so powerful at this point that you need multiple enemies in order for Luke to really stretch his legs and, and give us a sense of how strong and kick-ass he is. So I'm all about Luke seeing, uh, seeing Luke take on all six or seven Knights of Ren and uh, giving them a good old-fashioned beatdown. So, Corey, what do you think? Yeah, I'm kind of on the same page. Uh, I'm not going to differ from either of you two too much. James, I, I was thinking the exact same thing. Uh, I'm going to add Ray to the list because for sure at one point he's, they're going to have to spar. He, like he's going to shore the ropes, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Uh, I do not think he's going to go head to head with Kylo at any point in this film. The Knights of Ren, I can see him dispatching for sure. And Bradley again makes that great point of saying to justify or quantify for the fan, for the audience how powerful Luke is. It has to be a number of adversaries. And yeah, I could definitely rumors have it that he is going to take out these guys. 
Um, so yeah, let's let's have that. And toward the end of the film, why not throw in the uh, the red? Was it Praetorian guards? Those red suited guys. As he, you know, Luke's on his way approaching Snoke. Like, you know, he, we could take it in James' uh, thought that he had put out there a couple of months ago. Take it in that that vein. Easily dispatches the Knights of Ren. Maybe gets separated from Ray. Whatever it is, goes after Snoke. Again, dispatches uh, the Praetorian guards, maybe with a little more, bit more difficulty than he did the Knights of Ren, and then reaches Snoke, and you're like, "Go, Luke! Go, Luke!" And Snoke's just like one, two, three on him, like the way Kenobi pulled on Maul. Not necessarily again like killing him, but at least taking him captive and ending the film kind of there, where you're, as Kyle had mentioned in the past, like. Ray is just like, wow, like, I'm just beginning, like, I'm not ready for this, and my master just got, like, whooped in a big, big way. And now it's on me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's two, two questions in a row for Bradley, and we all, we're all four of us are on the same page. Boring. But, uh, listen, we're all correct, so anybody else who disagrees is, is again, we, we defend your right to be incorrect. Uh, it, we're all correct in the sense that we chose A, B, and D. <laughs> just not. Well, I, e. No, I'm, I'm, I'm. For now, in episode not, uh, episode eight, I'm with Knights of Ren. Let let just let Luke kick the the crap out of the Knights of Ren, <laughs> and anything else come can come later on. All right, Bradley. Thank you, sir. Hope that that tickled your question this week. Um, again, follow follow Bradley. At Bradley W Hall on Twitter, let him know. Who yeah, Bradley, think. thanks. He's been coming uh, week after week with uh, with solid questions. So yeah, uh, we're gonna have again, to man. give Bradley a, a, the, his segment a name soon. Yeah, just Ooh. about. Uh, just about. Yep. All right, Corey, you're gonna do the next question. All right, this one's from Neil, and Neil says, "Where do you see Star Wars in ten years' time?" Such a, such a sh- simple... This is what I said to Neil. And you, you can follow Neil on Twitter at Lowery Neil. And what I said to him is, what a great but simple question. So, Corey, where, where do you see Star Wars in 10 years' time? Uh, it's interesting. We've, we've talked about this somewhat in a different vein in the past. Uh, what I would kind of think at this point it gives them ample time to hopefully finish episodes seven, eight. And, well, we know seven, eight, and nine are going to be done at this point. It can give them the window between then. It's only 10 years. By the time episode nine comes around, it's going to be like eight. You could do anthologies in between. And you can put the saga on the shelf. So in 10 years time, we we'd have, we'll have seen, you know, the Han Solo the Obi-Wan, probably a Bounty Hunters film. And who knows from there, really. Maybe a couple of other anthologies, but 10 years time, we're talking the 50th anniversary. So I would like there to be a mega unveil. You know, we're, we're let's conclude this saga, continue on with Star Wars, and then for the 50th, you get this huge unveil that there's going to be a new saga made. Or even if you do episodes 10 11 12 for this saga and conclude it you still have a three way uh, three year time frame i would think there if you're doing the films every two years and anthologies in between so that's going to lead you right up to almost at a 10 year marker if they do 70 uh 10 11 12 anyhow so come the 50th they can say okay we're we're starting a new saga now it's Whatever it is, if they're moving forward into the future, which I really don't want, <laughs> or going backwards into the past, but uh, that's that's what I'm thinking. But ten well, years I, time, I, though, I think you hit on something key. Like if, if Neil had asked us this question a year or two from now, I think the answer might be very very different. But because uh, in 2027 we'll be looking at the 50th anniversary of, of A New Hope, I think. To, I mean, to put it bluntly, wherever Star Wars can be, it will be, like, times 10. James, what do, what do you think? Uh, I agree with both of you, really. I think 
I'll just continue what Corey was was leading, leaving off with there. I think it'll be um, you'll be pleased, Corey, in that I don't think it'll be in ten years' time. We'll be exploring too much of the future after the this uh, saga. I think ten years from now we'll be we'll be well into origins stuff. I'm sure that word was like you know well used in board offices when they when they talk about at uh, Lucasfilm, not Disney, when they talk about you know where to go with the franchise. I'm Origins must be a hot title, in or, or or a buzzword, I should say, in in Hollywood because a lot of origin stories have done super well. Yeah, for so, sure. You know, it, it's gonna go like they finish this saga, go do the origin saga for like you know maybe a decade or two, and then they come back to this original crew that they got going now with uh, Oscar Isaac, uh, Daisy Ridley, and um, Oscar Boyega, John Boyega. Say, John, sorry, <laughs> come back you know, 20, 30 years from now and say, hey, you guys want to reprise your roles, you know? And everybody will be teaming for it again at that point. Like, oh my God, they're coming back. It's a new Star Wars. I can see it. I can, yeah. I mean, they've done it once. They like to mirror themselves, so. That's it. Just put it on the <laughs> shelf for that long and, you know, it's it's awesome when these sagas and stories can, even I'd be okay with it at that point, you know, if you want to do, let's just not call it 13, 14, 15, you know what I mean? Like, I think get... it's hilarious that you just said even you would be okay with that since, as far as I know, since we've been doing this show, you've been okay with everything. No, well, I, I've, been very, <laughs> I've been very adamant on saying that I want a conclusion to this saga. Like, I want there to be some kind of your, resolution. The, the conclusion you get would be ruined if they did 13, 14, 15. They, just, but that, they would undo that c- conclusion. If they gave it at least a 20 to 25 year time frame. I might not even be alive for God's sake, but you know, if they, if they put it on the shelf for an ample amount of time and like, we're talking like John Boyega and all those guys are like in well into their fifties at this point, mid fifties, even early sixties. If they wait that long, then, you know, I'm 35 years, dude. Hey man, they got other stuff to do. Origins, like James said, anthologies, origins, finish this saga, first of all, even if they take it to a 12. I mean, time goes quick, man. Like I said, I, I might not even be around to to see it, but I would be okay with it if they brought it back in a long time from now. Just not like five years, like, hey, we're back, you know? like. Yeah. Um, I mean, somewhere in between, I think, is the likely answer. I don't think they let something sleep for that long anymore. Maybe five years is too soon, but I think ten is probably a good number. But it, it, I think you know the comics, movies, books, video games, all that stuff continues unabated. The animated stuff on TV, but I think what we'll get ten years from now, or, or what we'll be in the midst of, is sort of the evolution of of live action Star Wars on TV. Now, be it on you know, Netflix or network television, I don't know. Um, but I think that's going to become a big thing in the future. And, and what I think will be even bigger is the advent of virtual reality and how that's going to play into not just video games and, and that kind of standalone entertainment, but I think at some point technology will get, get to a level where you can marry the two. So you can have virtual reality headsets that interact with the live action TV show. So you almost get to immerse yourself into the story from a certain point of view. Um, I can totally see that happening. Remember the old Captain Power stuff? And of course, it was on VHS, so it wasn't like you were affecting live TV. Uh, But you could, you'd have like the toy that was almost like a a laser gun. And you, as, as there was like an assault of enemies coming at you or coming at the characters in the show and they were fighting, you could quote-unquote, help out, and you could shoot at the bad guys too. And I could totally see a day where you're watching a show on Netflix or ABC or whatnot, and you're wearing your virtual reality headset, and you're playing along to the actual show. And you're, in, in effect, have, you know, having a consequence on the outcome of the show. And of course, it's always predetermined, but I, I think you know what I'm getting at, right? Of course. That's a really good idea. Like, that could be the basis of the show is that every show is based on the fact that you're that the audience is a member of the crew or whatever. 
Yeah, I think it's like the ultimate way of getting fans into a Star Wars show without having them be on set. I think that I think that's how that goes in the future, ten years from now. I think that is very cool. And to add to that too, in ten years from now, I think as big as the they are in video games, I think they'll be like Star Wars may be the thing, the Mario, the you know, the the parent company is so big and the and the kids are so into these these new movies that I, I could see in 10 years from now um, the line of, of uh, video games out there that especially with virtual reality, reality like you're speaking about um, they could be like number one by a long shot in that uh, platform as well. I mean I, I can see VR if it's done right and done well and it's that immersive and it has that much of an addictive effect like imagine being imagine what Thursday night forget I'm not watching hockey I'm not going out with my friends I'm not doing anything it's Star Wars night I'm putting on my virtual reality headset and I'm going to I'm going to fight Darth Vader or I'm going to go defend uh, the rebel base against Vader's 501st. I'm going to hop on my speeder bike or I'm going to go and get in the trench or Yeah, it's definitely going to bring about the end of the world, that's for sure. I agree with you guys. I mean, everybody will, <laughs> everybody will be in their house. I mean, it'll be in a way like Wally where everybody's just going to be parked on their couch with their with their goggles on. It's wow, gonna we're going to really call this strange. episode Full Circle. We keep doing that. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I can totally see that. And if if it's done well and done right, I can see that almost supplanting the movies in terms of, of popularity. Or imagine they come to a point where they can you go to a movie and you VR that. You get yourself into the movie that way. Oh, game over, man. That's scary. It's scary. It sounds fun and all that. But it is a little scary at the same time. It's got to be limitations and rules. Rules. We've got some rules around here. Safe words? <laughs> yeah. All right. And um, Neil, thank you. I That's kind of our quick answer for that as, as the clock ticks on the show here. Uh, that That's where I see Star Wars. VR, baby. Yep. All right. So Thanks, want me to take the next one, too? Yeah, so the next one kind of plays off this one, and it's from Stubaka. Corey, why don't you go ahead and read that one? Yeah, Stubaka, one of the most positive people on Twitter I have ever seen. Love the Stubaka. So uh, following... And and also one of our our longest and most ardent supporters. True. He's been with us from almost the get-go. Yeah, Knight of the Commonwealth. Absolutely. All right, so uh, following on from Neil's question, did you ever think Star Wars would be where it is 10 years ago. Hell no. (laughs) Hell no. That's my quick answer. Um, I thought the films were done. We were told the films were done. We knew Clone Wars was coming. And I figured, you know what? Lucas is is hot into the animation thing. That's the future. TV is the future of Star Wars. You know, the, the books and the comics I had gotten out of collecting i was starting to taper off i figured tv was it i I believed that the movies were done with and i never thought disney would have been been the one to buy lucasfilm and that you know 10 years ago was what 2007 and so we were five years prior to that announcement now i I never would have thought that was coming at least not that soon i thought maybe uncle george was going to take it all to the grave with him or maybe get rid of it right before you know, he, he leaves this world. And so it, it, for me, the the future of Star Wars was TV and anything else was so far off that I wasn't even considering it. What about what about you guys? Go for it, James. It's funny, actually. I, I, I knew exactly what was going to happen. I just thought her name was going to be Tina and not Ray. But beyond that, I had everything. <laughs> Wasn't it Kira? <laughs> um. I definitely, yeah, a lot like you, Kyle. I don't even know if that I was thinking about what what Star Wars was going to be because I thought it was over. I thought, you know, we had the prequels and they didn't they didn't do as well as as hoped. I thought that uh, that you know I'd bought my last DVD and and maybe I'd get a new box set at some anniversary at some point in the future of the movies I already knew. Um, yeah, a revival. But, at yeah. Some point. Oh yeah, the fortieth is going to come in. 12 years time and uh, maybe we'll get some extra scenes stuff we haven't seen maybe they'll add something like that was sort of what I thought the future of Star Wars looked like mm-hmm. 
All right, Corey, Corey's going to blow us away. He's going to loophole this thing. No, no loopholes, but um, definitely kind of on the same page of you in the sense that, you know, we knew the, it was 2007 at that point, 10 years ago, right? Like uh, the prequels, again, well-received, not so well-received, but, you know, they they plowed forward with it. You know, they, they plowed forward with the vision and the Clone Wars brings a lot of clarity to those movies. It makes those movies better, like... And I'm on the same page as Kyle and saying that, you know, I really did believe that TV for the moment was the path they were taking. I really did not think that they would make a movie anytime this soon, let alone Disney buying the franchise or buying Lucasfilm. Uh, so, yeah, that, that news back in 2012 was just, uh, it was incredible. So I remember I, I being never... just slack-jawed. Like, my world stopped at that moment. Oh, for sure. And you had to figure, too, you know? Like, the, the Clone Wars was great. Uh, it, but Star Wars in general, it's just such a money-making venture. How can it just go sitting on the shelf untouched like that? There's so much uh, there's so much material out there to be touched upon and worked and whatnot. Now, this is the big question for me in the long run, and it's been since the beginning we've done this show, is... You know, Disney, Lucasfilm, whatever, they want to make a buck, fine. But make a point at the same time. Like, I could think we can all clearly agree that episodes one through six were a pretty well-rounded story unto itself. No? Like, the way it begins, the way it ends, you know, it's a very tight story. Six-episode story. Now, if we're going on to seven, eight, and nine... I really want it to have something to do with that first story. I want it to all tie together somehow and, you know, not neglect that original tale, you know. But uh, either way, I definitely didn't see it going on this way in the long run. I really thought it was sticking with TV. We heard rumors of detours. We also had heard rumors of a, a bounty hunter underworld type uh, TV show, which I still really hope they do, but definitely not to the anywhere near the magnitude of where we are now yeah i mean i mean just just to finish off <clears throat> I, I remember walking out of the theater in 2005 when the force uh revenge of the sith ended and i i don't remember who i was with maybe it was with uh, with my wife i was with you maybe, maybe it was you i looked at and i went well that's that it was, it was sort of like you know when um george and elaine and jerry their reactions towards one another once once they realize Susan's dead. It's just kind of like, well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's that's we're done. It's all over. And I remember walking to the theater and thinking, shit. I mean, Star Wars is done. That's the last Star Wars movie I'll ever see. And, and lo and behold, fast forward ten years, and we've got the Force Awakens and Rogue One under our belt. We debate each and every week about The Last Jedi and Colin Trevorrow in Episode 9. We're thinking about all these crazy things that are still coming in the future. And No, Stubaka, I never, ever thought any of this was coming. Not to this degree anyway, so. And not so soon. Not so soon. I thought I, maybe I would, have, I would have had to have been a lot older. We're truly blessed, Stubaka. Keep that positivity up. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you, Stubaka, for supporting us for so, so long. And, and thank for... you for having such a rad name. Every, you know, it goes overlooked because we're so used to it now, but that might be the best handle. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, you can follow Stubaka at Tales of Geekdom on the Twitter machine. And lastly, we close out the show with our good friend from Down Under. Matt Keegan's got a question for us this week. Disney gives you a cheerleading team that you can't touch, but you have to name them. Can't use tumbling saberettes because it's too easy. Corey, go. Are we doing this roundtable style or can I get a few out there or what's going on? You do what you want. All right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go slowly here. I'm gonna take it slow. First one, the chop tops. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, ding. That's a good one. All right. Wait, wait. Who's, who's, who, are, who are your cheerleaders? Or is it just like a random assortment of ladies who got a nice Star Wars name? Our uh, our interview po process will be rigorous. 
Oh, but, I bet uh, it will. Yeah, no, no, hands off, hands off. It's very clear in Matt's question here. But uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, we're gonna ask some good questions, and we just can't. We're not just gonna hire anybody here. All right. Well, clearly it's not amateur hour here, James. James, what do you got? Um. Well, first of all, I, I want to mention that. He, we can't call them the Tumbling Saberettes because it's too easy. Then that should be their name because, well, cheerleaders have a reputation. Oh, um, no. <laughs> That's not fair. Did I, am I going to offend all the cheerleaders that listen to the show? Yeah, dude. You live in uh, 2017 now. You, you've you offended everybody. <laughs> all right. I, well, that's chop rules with a Z. So <laughs> hit, me, hit, hit me up anytime. Um, so I, I'll start with my... my my, I think, worst one, but it's on the list anyways. I, I put Sithets just because, like, of the, of the sort of uh, dark side that it implies. I like, I like cheerleaders with an edge. Like, the, the, these are the bad girls of cheerleading? Correct. Like, the they'd kind be, of, kind of the go around clubbing their competitors in the knee? <laughs> the Nancy Kerrigan style. <laughs> oh, God, that's awesome. Uh, I, I only came up with one, and it's only because it's so good that I Everything else paled in comparison, so... Oh, man. I think we're going to nail the same thing here. Do it. (laughs) Well, for some strange reason, I imagined gathering up all the old ladies in Star Wars. Is that where you're going, Corey? Not at all. (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) So my cheerleading team is going to be Vice Admiral Holdo... And Maz and Jocasta New, the old Jedi librarian, and Jira and General Leia and Aunt Beru, the old Aunt Beru, and they're all gonna be doing the can can under the banner of old fossils. Maybe even Miss Gray can be a part of it. And I had a second name for them. Uh, they would be called the the, the Mine Knockers. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> That's chop rules with a Z. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. And uh, I, I could not get that out of my head after, so I'm going to just retire on top with the mine knockers or the old fossils. Um, but then, strangely, my, my, my thoughts drifted to a barbershop quartet of Lando, Poe, Finn, and Biggs. It's a, uh, sort of a random assortment. And they're called Biggs and the Big Deals. And uh, that's where I'm going to punch the clock here, guys. I'm done. I like it. <laughs> I still think I'm gonna win this, man. I'm gonna win Kigo's heart. You got another one, James? I got I got a few. Like these are these are typical cheerleader team names that I think would fit the Star Wars bill. So like the Cosmic Rays. I oh. like. I like. I like that. Uh, um, Galaxy, the Milky Ways, <laughs> uh, Infinity <laughs> Elite, uh, the Satellites. And but my the best one I thought I came up with, which isn't necessarily Star Wars, but just something like a good cheer <laughs> name that's space related would be Supernova. Yes. Well, they do say Supernova in Star Wars. It's a it's a thing. It's, that's a thing in Star Wars. Beautiful, even better. I do yeah. like those names though. Those are all pretty fitting. I I think there's some barbershop quartet names in there too, if I do say so myself. There may be some f- some figure skating team names. There may be some gymnastic team names. Like the, the satellites. That's a barbershop quartet. <laughs> that is a bar- that is a barbershop <laughs> quartet. Corey, Dude, what, you, what else you got? Well, James just totally inspired me now. Just having like listened to all those weird ones. <laughs> <laughs> I had. You ever seen? You know, remember Donnie Darko? I know you guys don't like the movie, but there was that the name of that girl band in uh, Sparkle Motion. <laughs> there was that. But nice. yeah, that, 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 well, that just came to me. But either way, I got I got two good ones. First one, I'm not sure which one to end it here with. I think I'm gonna end it with for Matt. So I'll start with Z yeah, you girls. You gotta you gotta bring it home here. Yeah, Z girls. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. I thought it was so good. Anyway, it's pretty good. But if if. Kyle adds one sound effect to any show ever. It should be crickets right there. <laughs> I think everybody way, had that going in their heads. I like Z Girls, okay? I think it's better than Chop Tops. That's why I saved it. So No, I think um, Chop Tops is better. No, I like Z Girls. 
piss off. All right, so my last one, this one's for Kigo, and I think I'm going to win it just right here. It's going to be uh, the Gunk Girls. Oh, Gunkers. Oh. <laughs> it's, Damn I think, it. I think he set us up. Gonkers. I think he was waiting for us to do Gonkers the whole time. <laughs> God damn it. Well, I'm glad, I'm we, mad at I'm myself. glad we actually I'm mad. sprung the trap. We solved mean, the riddle. You mean Ooh. I actually solved the riddle? Well, you went. No, you, you went didn't. Gonk girls. It was. Yeah, it was. A, I mean, I'll, I'll accuse close. myself. But uh, the, the riddle was solved. It was yeah, a team effort, a good Corey. One. Good job. All around, I, I like you. that. Was pretty creative on all your parts. I love those gonkers. Ones. Definitely, there's, there's, the a, best there's a t-shirt in making. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll line up a bunch of gonk droids and do, have them doing the can can with some pom poms. Oh, girls gonk wild! <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> oh, snap, Wexley! That's that's the winner. That's pretty good, eh? Well done, Corey. My hat is off. Thanks, brother. Yeah, no, that's that's saved. That is the episode title. That is the MVP of the show. And that is where we end the show on Gonks Gone Wild. Holy shit and a half. That was strong. <laughs> At the high note. Wow. There And there's a t-shirt in the making as well. It Girls abs- Gonk Wild. Absolutely sell like hotcakes. That's coming for sure. Oh, God. I don't know how we recover from that. I think we should, <laughs> episode 80 should be the final episode of this show. It's all downhill from here. I mean, that, that's some evergreen content there. All right, guys. That's it. Uh, a couple hours in the can here. Thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate you guys and all the time you give us. Um, and thank you especially this week to Ads, Bradley, Neil, Stubaka, and Matt. Excellent questions, one and all. And I, I hope to hear from you again soon. And guys, where can we find you on social media between shows? Come on, Kyle. You can find me at Chop Rules with a Z. Beautiful. James, where are you at? Yep, still find me at Tommy Bombadil one Excellent. I'm at Tumbling Saber on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Come check us out. We'd love to talk Star Wars with everybody. And don't forget, we got a new member of the podcast network for you all to check out, San Diego, Sa- San Diego Sabres Radio. Go check those guys out. Give them a listen. Give them a shout out. And uh, tell them Tumbling Sa- Saber and the rest of the Commonwealth sent you. Uh, leave us a review on iTunes if you haven't, and that will help grow the show. It's been a while since we had one. And uh, we'll be eternally grateful for that. And we also uh, we have to remind you now that we are $4 more to the kitty, thanks to Corey this week for his slip ups. And so that, that puts us at what, $16, I think? You're not yep. getting off the hook for those ones, Corey. Those ones are locked and loaded. And, uh, hey, it's, yeah. it's fine. As long as we get to go out, I'm all about it. We'll, we'll, we will make it happen. It's going to happen soon. And, uh, again, guys, another Sith Disturbers coming at you this week for the 30th anniversary of Spaceballs. Can't wait to do that. That's, so get, get a viewing of Spaceballs in. Sharpen, sharpen up your pencils for that and uh, get re-familiar with the best spoof of all time. So Call it what it is, Kyle. Homework. Everybody has homework. Watch Spaceballs. Watch Spaceballs. Enjoy Spaceballs and enjoy the week and we will be back later to coast you into the weekend with some, <laughs> some laughs, shits and giggles about Spaceballs. So thanks guys for listening and we'll talk to you soon.
watching you walking away from me. Were you watching me? Was it just a dream? Just a dream. And I believe I can save you. Just don't let me go. And I can see I'll be waiting. Always You guys ever try Piri Piri sauce? Fuck is that good.